Mike Olson. Welcome to the ROI Online Podcast. Steve Brown, it is such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, listen, listen to this voice, folks. Uh, <laughs> immediately gets your attention. But That's not nice. only does he have the voice, he's got user psychology bubbling around in there. He's got conversion <laughs> data. He's got marketing. Mike, tell us I, a little bit about your background. Why, why this beautiful voice and why the data? I think bubbling around in there is the right way to have said that. That's funny. Um, I, you know, of, of all things, um, way back when, when I was in college, I was a vocal performance major. And um, so my, my career actually started out both in radio and um, in singing. And after for about 10 years of being out on the road and getting married and having kids and realizing that I wanted my kids to recognize me um, when I was around. Um, it was time to make a little bit of a change. Um, and so I needed to come home and all of a sudden I had a resume that basically said, you know, stick a mic in front of this kid or he doesn't know what to do. Um, and, and I had had a little experience while we were touring and traveling, um, doing some marketing for my own group. Um, it wasn't very good, but it was marketing. And, um, and I'm nothing if not stubborn. So I started diving into it um, just to kind of understand how to get better at it even then. And so when I started looking for a gig, the only thing I could even attach my name to was marketing at that point in time. And wow. I, I worked my way into basically an admin gig. I was getting coffee and tea for a team of people. Um, I spent about 10 years at that company. And by the time I left, I was their creative director. Um, S so before we go further, what's yeah. the name of this group, this group that <laughs> kept you so busy for so long? Um, it was, it was an acapella group of all things. They, you know, there's, there's not many people who need a voice like this, um, in their group, but, <laughs> but acapella did, uh, back when nobody knew what one of those was. And it was, um, it was a group called LMNOP. Um, <laughs> we, we still to this day, maybe once a year or so, we'll get together and just goof around, sing a concert, like in our hometown or something like that. It was, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. Was that, so is this a Denver based group? Um, well, we, we were all originally actually from Fort Collins, about an hour north of there. But yeah, um, we, we kind of headquartered out of Denver. But for the better part of a decade, um, we, sing, we sang and, and toured and recorded all over the country and actually even all over the world. So we were, we were pretty lucky. We had a really good time of it back then. Well, how do you get... So uh, I'm not from that world. And so these yeah. questions may sound dumb or naive. No, but, no, please. But how, how does an acapella group stay busy and on tour? Um, you know, it's, it was kind of funny um, the way that we stumbled into it. Uh, we all went to high school together and then we all went our separate ways. But as we were getting, getting to the mid to latter stages of college, everybody was gravitating back towards town. Um, we had all done this in unique groups um, and, and you start seeing the weak spots and you start wishing for, you know, just that right voice to plug into just that right place. And um, this, this, for me, kind of dream group of the five of us uh, got together and, and it was just funny how quickly it clicked, um, how quickly we were doing shows that I had never been able to do before. Um, just because of, I, I, we just, there were so many talented folks involved. Um, and, and more than anything, um, just, just uh, able to start putting some pieces together that way in terms of uh, our ability to both um, improve, do better. Uh, this is a theme, I guess, that kind of runs throughout my life and, and um, start to put ourselves in a position to succeed um, for folks in auditions and, uh, and things of that nature. Um, suddenly we're touring all over, uh, our state and we start getting some notice that way. Um, so then, um, we, we start getting some national gigs that picks up enough attention that a radio, uh, station out of one of the places we're in starts playing us. And that gets us enough attention that we start doing some recording for a small label. And, and I'm not sure uh, how that just kept building momentum, um, especially for something that people didn't know very well, but uh, suddenly we're doing uh, paid gigs at, you know, colleges and, and small town uh, arts venues and things like that, that just, 
it just kept us going. We, you, you never heard of us, but there's a lot of musicians out there that make a decent living just, just out there, you know, entertaining on the road. And we were having a ball doing it. It was just fun. So it seems like with your voice, with your experience, you would have been a natural fit in radio somewhere, no? It was actually, um, that was how I would fill in the blanks. You know, we'd be out on the road about, uh, it, it depended, you know, it, it, it built over the years. I think our busiest year, um, we were out well over half the year. Um, and, and in between, I still had to fill in cracks for my paychecks, basically. So yeah, I do a lot of, I do a lot of voiceover work, either live on radio or, um, you know, audio books weren't as big a thing back then, but I still had a little experience in that regard as well. And um, yeah, I, I just got really lucky. A couple of folks in my family have uh, very deep voices before me. And I think I just got the genetics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, when you're talking about the label, I just, I think about that Boston song, <laughs> you know, that the guy smoked a big fat cigar and drove a Cadillac <laughs> car and he said, yeah. boy, I, I think this spans out of sight. Is that the experience that happened? You know, it, it's, it's funny. It's kind of how it worked out. Yeah. Is, um, we were doing a show where we ended up um, opening for a much larger group, um, America, actually. And, uh, and just uh, a couple of folks who came to the gig actually had come to see them, but actually wanted to talk to them about some recording and pieces like that. And they saw us and they went, oh, well, wow. let's, let's look at something like that, right? Um, yeah. we, we also uh, uh, had a couple of folks from a different angle coming at us similarly. Um, and so it, it actually made for some decisions on our part as to what we were going to do and who we were going to go with. It was, it was pretty, um, it was a very heady time. This is not something that happens to most people. And, um, I'm just a young kid, not really knowing any better. So the label that ended up approaching us, um, was called shadow mountain records. Um, and, and they, uh, they, we did our first album with them and it was, it was really cool. It was really fun. So, so can people find your album on like Amazon music or prime music or they can actually, yeah. I would imagine anyway, um, elemental P is spelled a little differently, but, uh, uh, starts, it starts with an E. If you start E L E you'll find the rest of it. But, uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. E L E. E L E. Yeah. So your title after your name is kind of uh, mysterious and appealing. It's C-X-O. Yeah. And it's like, who wouldn't want an X in their <laughs> the title of their job there? Yeah. yeah. Well, one of my kids calls me the X-Man. I, I, you know, and, and I was a comic book geek as a kid, so uh, it, it makes me laugh. Um, but... But yeah, uh, chief experience officer, and and this is just a, frankly, a very small concern of uh, me and a couple of buddies who have come to find over these years. Um, there's there's just as much education in this space to be done as there is actual work. You know, there's a lot of folks who don't really understand um, so much how to play the game of actually online experience and and how to blend qualitative and quantitative into, you know, actual feedback. Actually, yeah. this is what my consumers are telling me. This is what I should be doing to take action on that thing. And, and then how to thoughtfully take action in that direction. Um, and, and I just, I've been really lucky over the years. I stumbled my way into, um, you know, that, that gig in marketing, but there was so much around the creative that I just didn't get. I just didn't understand when I, you know, um, I I do five somethings for for people to choose between, and some alpha dog walks into a room with five other people and goes, "I like the blue one," and and you say, "I uh, oh okay, why why is that the right one?" And by then they're already gone out of the room, and you think, "Are, are we even making the right choice?" And so, yeah. learning some of this process myself, um, I was lucky to start working for a company where I got to do qualitative and quantitative at a scale that most people never see in their careers. Um, yeah. and so it just, it taught me so much about the space. And then when you get out and you start talking to people about how these things actually work, there's so many interesting misconceptions that, um, I do, I find myself talking about it as much from an educational perspective as I do just in getting people kind of set up in their spaces. So, uh, me and a couple of buddies are 
helping some pretty <laughs> decently sized companies out that way these days. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's really interesting to me. So I'm a little geeky about it. Well, let's, uh, let's do this. So I believe that instead of focusing on SEO, search engine optimization, we actually sure. should be focusing on HEO, human experience optimization, right? It is. You're and, exactly right. And so, you know, all these big brands are basically teaching our consumers, our clients, our prospects, what to expect when they come online. And, mm -hmm. and this thing in our brain, the brain stem, I call it the bodyguard, is in play at that time. And there are certain sites, there are certain shops or whatever where we walk in and we just feel at home. We feel understood. We feel yeah. safe. Right. And, and it's not something necessarily you can guess at. And no. so for the folks that listen, we, you know, I've got, business owners, I've got marketing directors, I've, I've got students, you know, these, these story brand guides, but here's our problem. You're running a business and you're trying to, you don't have time to dig deep into mountains of data to make an educated call. And so that, that scene that you, you were talking about where the guy comes in and just goes, I like the blue one and he's yeah. out of there. He yeah. didn't have any backstory. He didn't, right. have, and he, more, more than that, he doesn't have the time to really dig into that. But how does what you do really become legitimate? And he, so here's, we take a stab at A-B testing, but to really get clarity on A-B testing, which is, so you're going to show A version, mm -hmm. and then the next visitor is going to see the B version, and we're only measuring one little piece and we're going to see which one's more effective over a period of time and a sampling. And then we're going to focus on another thing. Well, you know what that means? That means you have to have thousands of visits to get really good data. And guess what small business websites don't have? They don't have. Yeah. They don't have that quantitative capability basically. And so um, in that way, um, the, the only way that I've seen small businesses use quantitative really effectively that way is to be paying attention to the only times they touch something in their stack that actually makes the needle move enough, mm -hmm. right? If you still look at that from a, uh, from, from a sheer stat sig perspective, you still might see things on occasion, typically things like calls to action, either in your headlines or your buttons or whatever. Those are the places that you're still gonna see those, those seismic jolts, right? When you do something. And, and one of the things that's tough for those small businesses to understand is oftentimes the first few times you touch those things, those seismic jolts do not move this direction, right? They don't, they're not upwards, you know, they're, they're, they, they die if they take a big nose dive. Right. And, and that's when people typically walk away from quantitative very quickly. They go, everything I did messed things up. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I understand that, um, what your consumer was telling you though. Um, and this is, I, I have to talk to big companies about this just as much as small companies, because everybody's really proud of how often they don't lose. Right. Mm -hmm. But losses are actually the way that your consumer is at least telling you this thing matters to me. This yeah. is very important to me. Um, that's, that's important knowledge to have. And it's an important button if you've got it, even as a small business to kind of keep poking at, because one of those guesses is going to make that jump the other direction and and you've got to have the stomach to keep trying it if what you're looking to do is improve that way but what you do have still is you've got qualitative you know you've still got your consumer feedback so you need to figure out then instead how do i use those channels effectively with my consumers to engage them in a conversation not you know you don't you still can't if if you're if you're approaching them in a relationship, you still can't approach them basically by saying, here's what I need from you. You need to engage them in conversation to say, what is it you need from me, basically, right? And, and that's yeah. the big difference in, in how you get qualitative to not only stay effective, but actually something that you continue to converse back and forth with your consumer about. So you hear them as to why they keep banging into walls. And that's how that's how companies get to that more intuitive 
safer, I understand you space that you're talking about, basically, right? So let's cover a little vocabulary just, sure. just for me. So we said stat sig. Yes, so statistical significance, sorry. Um, statistically okay. significant, um, meaning that uh, the way a stat sig calculator works is basically to remove randomization from the picture, right? And so you talked about thousands of consumers on each side, and, and typically that is true. Um, you, you, for most stat sig measures, um, what you're changing is a small enough change that it doesn't make a big enough disruption for you to say, I have flipped a coin this many times and the results that I have gotten are telling me, right? Mm -hmm. um, the way I end up teaching this in a class is actually very noisy because um, I will sit down with a group of 50 to 100 people and I'll have them all flip a coin 10 times and keep track of their results, right? And you look at the different results across the room and somebody in that room, I've had folks actually very rarely, but flip heads or tails 10 times in a row, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the conversation you have quickly is, okay, you, you got seven heads and three tails. Can you expect heads to land at 70% for the rest of your life? And, and, and they immediately understand that that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's not the way that works. And, and what that means is at least in that example, you've not flipped that coin enough times, right? But it also doesn't mean that you, if you do see 10 heads and then you see 20 heads and then you see, you know, 27 out of 30 are heads, there's a point in there that a statistically significant calculator is going to say, that's, that's not random. I don't know if it's as big or as small as, as what you're initially seeing, but that is certainly not random. And that's how you use it to at least kind of feel around in the dark that way and say, okay, I found what's important. These are at least the spaces that I can keep changing until I find a headline. I find a call to action. I find meaningful copy that tells my consumer, this is where you thought you were going to be basically. Okay. So then there's, so that is, leads us to quantitative, meaning yeah. that I'll let you explain it, but you bet quantitative um, is, you know, AB testing is a great example of exactly what you were talking about. And there's, there's other types, there's multivariate testing, there's, there's multi-armed bandit testing. There's, there's different methods into this, idea of I show unique presentations to a consumer and then I lock them into that presentation every time they come back so that they have that same experience because sometimes I don't convert them the first time that they come. You know, sometimes it's the second or third time they come. So I make sure that I lock them into that experience so that I understand how they're responding to it. Um, somebody else has a different experience. I watch enough of those to basically have that mathematics in the background and that stat sig calculator say, here's something, here's something that is unique and, and it's actually standing out um, basically. So, so quantitative is basically, it's that asking the consumer, which of these things do you prefer more? And then watching enough people respond to it until you actually feel like you've got an answer to the question. And the advantage in this case is that you're not asking them where they're actually thinking and trying to guess what answer you want to hear. They're reacting to presentations. It's exactly it. Um, you know, this is not, this is certainly soft science when you look at it this way, right? Uh, 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 a typical scientist would look at a lot of this and say, you've got a lot of holes in mm -hmm. how you're examining this, but you're at least examining it from a scientific perspective. Um, and in this case, um, the person who is having this experience does not know as they're having the experience that they're basically being watched in that regard as to how they respond to that. Whereas qualitative, and I'm sure that, you know, if, going, if you yes. don't mind, that's where we were probably headed. <laughs> um, qualitative is more the conversation actively engaged, right? I, I want to know what you like. I want to know what you dislike. This is, this is where you have to be much more careful to not lead your consumer with your own opinions, basically, right? This is why you have to not go to your consumer and say something like, why does this page suck? Basically, right? Because mm -hmm. then the consumer looks at that page from the perspective of, oh, that page sucks actually. Okay. Why is that? What's, what's wrong with it? I'm only going to give you feedback now of why I think something is wrong with it. Um, you know, and, and, and companies don't think so much about how they influence their consumers when they have that conversation, when they talk to them, because they're so 
busy trying to get what they want out of the conversation that oftentimes they don't think about the human being on the far side of that and how their responses are going to go. And you've, you've got to be careful with these types of studies. I mean, them just seeing your logo influences the people who are at least pleasers in that crowd and just want to tell you, I, I love your site. There's nothing wrong with it. Everything's perfect. That's why I come back here time after time. Well, that's beautiful to hear, right. but it doesn't I... help me get better basically. Right. And so you want to be careful about how you approach that consumer and say, you know, what, what was your experience? What could we do better? What did we do great at? I, you know, uh, you, you want to hear those things, but you want to really be thoughtful about not leading them into your opinion, basically. So th this is excellent. Here's, here's the struggle though for, you know, 98% of the businesses in the States at least have 20 or less employees. And so what that means is the owner of the company or the leader of the company is having to wear all these hats, okay? Yeah. And data, assuming they're engaged and they really want to do this, data can be extremely misleading and you can misread it and make all these mistakes. And yet we're competing against organizations that have highly weaponized armies, artificial intelligence, data, um, um, technology, harvesting all of these insights. They even have all the visits. Sure. And so that's the big giant or the villain that we're fighting against here. And what I'm excited about in this conversation is someone that's been in that realm yeah. ha has paid the dues, done the reps. You start to see commonalities or fundamentals that start to reveal themselves that could actually be in play without needing all of this wrong exactly no that's exactly it and and that's exactly you know um i i love how you said that because there's really a ton of practical application in this frankly not just in my opinion in business but in life there's there's a lot of ways that this these principles just from what we've talked about from an overarching perspective can be applied to how you come at um, your business decision-making, how you come at um, your consumers and, and how you continually improve this way. I, I think you're absolutely right that there are mountains of data and it's easy to make um, poor choices and poor guesses in all of that. And I think sometimes that's because we are still not thoughtful and methodical in how we approach those steps. We, we will take a first step of say qualitative data and we'll see three out of 20 consumers tell us that, you know, I really hate that headline. And suddenly we're just fixated on a headline that do you, do you expect more than 17 out of 20 people to be in love with the way that you talk to them? You know, that's, that's, that's maybe not something that you necessarily need to be spending that time on. Um, if, if you're only getting that level of feedback, if seven out of 20 told you, I'm not sure I care for how you phrased this, that's probably something more that, you know, and, and so it's still that thoughtful moment of saying, what did the data actually tell me as opposed to looking at the data and saying, I have to get something out of this data doesn't tell you something every time there's, there's not an answer every time you're looking, you're, you're ferreting around for what matters basically. And, and it is, it's, it's a long exercise and it can be an exercise in frustration, but even at that level, even with 20 employees, um, you know, your consumers are giving you feedback. If, if they are not converting, they're still giving you some form of feedback. You know, there are some really simple, thoughtful, free tools out there to be able to at least reach out to them and say, hey, you have just a couple minutes to tell me why you're leaving, to tell me why you didn't complete the cart, to tell me, you know, where, where we, we got close, where did we go wrong, basically. Mm -hmm. yep. No, the, I'm just thinking the trap here we are where we've got humans mm -hmm. coming and experiencing whatever our platform is. Just like if they walked into your store, there's a virtual representation of your store or your, your office or whatever it is. 
and and yet they're humans and that brain is in play but here's the the problem the trap is being too logical and too consumed with the analytics and the data where it takes you into an anti-human mindset yeah you could be actually leading or misleading the expectations of the data and totally overlook what this human with a brain and a name and a hopes and dreams and a family is needing from you in that moment. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's funny as you say that, but I actually find that to be even far more the province of the big company. The large company tends to lose track of who their consumer is. They tend to lose track of um, that that part of the equation. They've become the 800-pound gorilla more often than not, to the point of just basically saying, "Here's my thing, take it or not." You know, because mm-hmm. because they've graduated to a point that that conversion at a much smaller level still still makes their business roll. You know, they can think about bigger, broader things that way. Um, I. I tend to find that small businesses that at least have gotten to a point of past sole proprietorship, you know, even when you're getting into that five or 10 range, nine times out of 10, those are the folks that really understand their consumer and they really understand their consumer base. They may not know how to have that conversation with them. That's a very different animal, Mm -hmm. right? But they, they know them, they know what they're looking for. They know who their core audience is. Um, Sometimes it's that, 20 to 50, it's that 20 to 100 that gets to be a challenge because you know who your core audience is, but they're only big enough to get you to, now I need 20 bodies to run this. If you want to be a business that needs 100 bodies to run it, sometimes you've got to go out and then find those other audiences who need your offering and just don't know it yet. And that's where it gets, that's that's where all this comes in, you know. I, I would argue there's this tipping point in a organization when it gets a certain size it stops seeing the people that are buying their products or appreciating what they do or really drawn to them it stops seeing them as humans and starts to put this consumer costume on it which covers their face and so it makes them faceless nameless credit they have credit cards that we how are we going to exploit this potential consumer and that's where it gets off the rails and i think that's where marketing is broken i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more i i think um i think so many times in that particular aspect as you start really rooting around for how do i squeeze one more dime out of this consumer you know how do i get one more something one more month subscription you know out of this consumer we Part of the reason that I was happy to step out and start um, moving into uh, being able to do this as a consultative effort is because you find yourself in too many conversations um, with too many C-level folks and, um, and legal uh, concerns saying, how, how close to this line can we actually get in our conversation? And, and once, once you're thinking in that regard, I think, I think you've lost sight of your consumer, basically, um, to exactly your point. You've, I think you said it really well. You've pulled this mask over them, and it doesn't, just, it doesn't just change your relationship with them from how much you know them. It changes your relationship with them from how you think of them. Mm-hmm. They're not that human being anymore. They're just, they're just the person that you're just squeezing that one more little drop yeah. of blood out of. And I, you know, um, I, I'll tell you the folks that I think are always doing it best are the ones that are not that short-sighted are the ones that understand that this has to be a mutually beneficial something between us um, for it to be long lasting, for it to be something that long-term you have faith and trust in me. So. Yeah. That's, I think that's, there's just this, once you stop seeing that human there, think, think about your mindset. I'm in charge of writing copy or designing some asset that we're going to be presenting to these faceless, nameless consumers. Think about how you would approach it and what energy you would put into it or insights would be way different than if you were designing that for your buddy that you're going to have sit and have a beer with later. Yeah. You're going to design two very different assets. And yet, yeah. 
guess who's really evaluating your assets? Yeah. Well, okay. and, and it's a slippery slope, right? I mean, yes. when you, when you get to where you want to be, um, you know, that, that day down the road and you really are seeing millions of consumers coming through your site, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to not lose track of that face a little bit because now all of a sudden it's, well, this is, this group broadly fits into this category, or this is, this is true about all of this group of people. And, and, and you start to blur those lines. It's, it's interesting. I, I argue. So the, I always say our world has become industrialized, but so is our marketing or the way that communication in general has become industrialized. And I believe it's happening at that point where you know, I'm, when I say industrialized as like your brain wants to be free range and just run amok and, and eat grasshoppers at its own and yet we're wanting to herd them into this industrialized milking station that you're allowed in if you can have a credit card because we're just going to we're just going to machine them machinize this it's exactly right it's exactly true and and because of that uh loss of uh sight of who you're treating and how you're treating them um, it, it really does get to be sort of a processing lather, rinse, repeat. You're not so concerned about who you lost as long as you gained more than you lost. Um, and, and I've watched it be a very uh, affecting thing. It's, it's, it was even more disheartening sometimes when you do some of those tests and you'd see a psychology work on an audience for a while. And then that psychology would go away as as people get smarter and wise up to the tactics that are behind that original thought. Right. And, and so in a long way, it gets to be a bit of a chess game and there's a lot that there's, there's a lot of dehumanization to that. Um, you're, you're basically saying, well, if, if you're not going to buy now, then I'm going to take this, this half step further. Right. And, and that's, um, that's a tough game to keep playing over the long haul. So yeah, it's, it's very true. You're absolutely right. So let's say that you, you were our buddy and you knew we had a, a company and, and one day we got a couple of beers in you and convinced you to come over <laughs> and just, just help me reveal several fundamentals that are always in play, no matter the size of sampling. What are the, Give us like three valuable things that we can pull in a, and apply pretty much in most cases. Um, in most cases, uh, you can always, um, I, don't, I don't care how good you think you are at it, you can always do a better job of listening to your consumer. Um, I, I am shocked at how often, and I mean, 90 plus percent of the time companies tend to be presenting from the point of here's what I need from you instead of, instead of here's what I am offering you. Um, I, I think there's always room to continue to improve in that regard. And that is, um, that's a, that's a huge piece of the puzzle just in understanding that consumer base. I think, I think that is always a truth. Give, it, give um, us some examples how we can do that. Um, that's absolutely. When, uh, I, when you've got, um, whether it's a product or an offering or a service, um, more often than not, um, the way that that has been pieced together and presented is by you and your team um, talking through, here's who we are, here's what we have to offer, um, here's, you know, we're, we're going to put our best face forward on this idea, whether that is a physical or, or whatever sort of a product. Um, it is so rare for that team that has been so far down that rabbit hole that has made all of these assumptions about here's everything we've learned in our expertise and here's all we know. It is so rare for that to then be turned around and presented as and here's how I would say that to somebody who is seeing it for the very first time, mm -hmm. basically, right? And so <laughs> the curse of knowledge, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, you, you, you now know you've you've 
bitten the apple, basically, right? And you cannot unknow, as it were. Um, it's it's a real trick. It's a real habit for folks who sit in professions like mine to to try like crazy when you're looking at something for the thousandth time to kind of shake that etch a sketch and try to be there for the first time again. Um, and that's why invariably um, you need to understand what's happening with your first time consumer. And if that's just you sitting down with a group of your friends in your living room to say, I want to see you interact with my website. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to be smart enough to get out of their way and actually let that happen. Watch them make those mistakes, watch them stumble in spots that the interaction doesn't work well for them. Um, watch them get confused and, and stand far enough back from that in, in whatever regard you can to basically watch people have a hard time with the things that you thought were obvious. Yeah. Right? So you, you can't be sensitive. You can't no. be like, that's my baby. Yeah. And another trap I've, I've noticed is you can fall into, would you give me a nice testimonial back? I'm right. Instead yeah. of like, where's this baby ugly? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, well, and I think the funny thing is, um, you know, relationship marketing um, actually offers you a great opportunity at some of this type of qualitative feedback. It's not as if this needs to just be strictly a research effort, a slog. Um, you know, this can be a part of just your typical interaction with your consumer where you're saying, hey, I'm going to give you X for doing Y. Um, this can all be folded into that part of the relationship where it can be a much more congenial, collegial Hey, just, just tell us how we're doing, right? Because more often than not, that not only gets you a few of those quotes from the fans who are saying, I, I can't live a day without your product. Those are that type of social proof is important stuff to get up in front of your consumer, right? You know, mm -hmm. if, if somebody likes it this much, maybe I will too. Um, so I definitely understand why people are driving for that. But in that same conversation, if you just step it back to this degree to just say, tell us how we did, you're also going to have a few folks who come in, see that experience, that, that happy, shiny experience and go, this was not for me. And they're going to tell you why. And if you can get even just a few of those, you're going to get some good thinking and opinions around, here's how I can improve this to still keep capturing even more of that fringe, you know, unless you're getting hundred percent of your folks, it's a conversation worth having. All right. So that was a good number one. Good. Um, I, I am very much, um, you know, you, you had uh, illustrated very well how uh, quantitative can be such a difficult piece of the puzzle for a small business who is getting um, such, such small feedback that way. But I'm, oh, I'm actually, I, I hate to interrupt you. Maybe, can I give you an example of why? Yeah, I'd love that, please. So we have all these visits and one of the things you look at is your bounce rate. Oh, your bounce rate's so high or whatever. But if you're a small business and people aren't going to the phone books anymore, how do you know they're not just showing up to see what the phone number is to call you? That's exactly it. Um, so I think something else that um, I have seen become really powerful these days, um, and this is kind of a blend. You know, we've talked about qualitative and quantitative. This is kind of a blend of the two um, site recording tools. Um, there are a ton of them out there these days, and it used to be only a spot that the the big dogs could play in because every last one of them that came out in you know ten years ago to five years ago was so expensive, and and was such a heavy lift to put onto your website. And and I'll I'll say a little bit more about it because a lot of folks may not know what I'm talking about. Um, but basically, it's just something that sits in the background and watches how people interact with your site from a click perspective, from a time on task perspective, um, from a, you know, if they're trying to get something to go through, did somebody click on this thing 15 times because it made them angry? It just gives little insights into how people are actually interacting with your site. And you can see things like what you're talking about. You can say, oh my gosh, I, I not only... Um, 40% of my bounce rate or what I was calling my bounce rate, giving air quotes here is actually somebody just coming to figure out how to call me, uh -huh. you know, 
that ends up being really good news. It doesn't mean that that's the end of what you should do with that piece of feedback, right? Because if you didn't look at that and realize, oh crap, I should add my phone number at the very top of my page because I just made everybody scroll down to find it. And that's why everybody's been bouncing. Okay. Take, take that piece of data, do something with it, try this thing and see if you don't actually not only reduce your bounce rate, um, but, but actually have people getting through to you more, more easily, more frequently. Heck go out, go out to Google and get a secondary phone number. Try that on your website and move that to the top and see how many people start calling it. There's still, there's still data to be had out there, even, even in the onesie twosie sort of a, sort of a way, you know, I'm, so we have what's called lucky orange. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. Yeah. But truthfully, you know, I don't, I don't know how to really take advantage of the insights on there. I, you know, I'm confessing I'm in this business. We have it on our site. Yeah. I love looking in there, but I don't truthfully, I don't, here's my, here's what I struggle with. I see an insight there. Then I go tell my designer and they push back. Right. And I'm, yeah. so I don't know. I don't have this authority. I don't have all this experience. I'm not clear. And it's not that they push back. What I'm saying is how can they take that data and not be sensitive about their design and like really become this beautiful human oriented designer for yeah. online experiences? It's, um, you know, it's the first time I ever saw the phrase was actually um, reading some, some Stephen King. He was talking about writing, but he, you really do have to be ready to kill your darlings. You know, in, in this case, you can't be married to that thing. And, and uh, believe me, I come out of the design field as I come into this. So I, I understand that feeling of, I really loved that. I, I poured myself into that thing. That doesn't mean that that's going to work best for your consumer. I've mm -hmm. <laughs> over the years in all of those tests, um, I have often come to find that at least with certain audiences, you have got to design down. You, you know, if it looks too slick, if it looks too inviting with certain audiences, it turns them off. They, they, they come into this thing and they think, oh, you're just trying to, you know, sell me into something. And, and I don't, I don't have time for this level of slick. Um, it doesn't it's, feel safe. Yeah, it, it does not. Exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't give me that warm fuzzy that makes me want to hang out this trigger. Um, and, and so the way that, Frankly, um, I tend to, I run into this problem in more spaces than just with designers, right? It's not just designers that want to push back. I mean, heck, you get to big enough companies. Now you're talking to the legal department who's saying, we can never try that. We can never say that. And, and so the, the way that I tend to pull anybody who's not into this process in is making them a conspirator making them a collaborator basically right saying look here's what here's the feedback we're getting you are a creative soul help me figure out how we're going to make this happen and suddenly you're in this fight together it's not you coming and saying hey why does this design suck right here basically right it's more you saying okay we're 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 big enough that I've been able to hire you I've got enough of a crew I mean we figured some of this out but we want to keep going here's what we're trying to get to. How do we take what you've already done and make this happen even further? And that's, that's where the conversation, that's where it gets fun actually. And, and you're a great tip. You're, you're almost never, you know, and, and so that, um, you know, the session recording tools, I think is tip number two. I think you can learn so much from out of that stuff, even, even at the level that you're looking at it, Steve, and, and sure there's, are there a lot more deep dive insights to be had for a company that has somebody that can just sit and root around in that stuff all day? Mm -hmm. Probably. But these tools, similar to what we talked about in quantitative, are primarily designed to give you the, here's the biggest stuff. Here's what the numbers are telling me. Somebody, you, they, they call them rage clicks, that, that click, 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 click. I can't get this to work, right? Yeah. Um, like an LED. I see, I see what, you know, 10% of your traffic rage clicking in this space, you're going to get some feedback from your tool about that. Right. And that's an important something to know. Um, I, I think that that's a, a powerful something there. And then, you know, 
I, I think you were, you were already kind of pointing um, in this direction as we were wrapping up that last piece, but, but to me, um, number three, that I think is really important for, for small companies to uh, get their arms around this way is that it's, it's constantly in motion and it is about that um, conspirator piece together because what everybody needs to understand in this game, um, well, here's, here's a better way for me to approach this. Um, over the course of my career now, just from a quantitative perspective, I've run almost um, 18,000 AB tests over the course of my career, right? I've, I've yeah. seen, I've seen a lot. Um, I've seen, I've seen a little too much that way. And I have run thousands and thousands of qualitative tests as well. And, and the math that bubbles up out of that at the end of the day is that you are wrong far more often than you're right. And you need to understand that walking into this is that even if you've got the right idea, oftentimes you're going to take the wrong execution the first time you do it. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It means that you need to keep thinking through how to get that to click with your consumer until you do. And, and you know, a lot of companies, even if they do have the opportunity to do quantitative and qualitative, they will walk away from a win or a loss the first time as if it's everything that they could have gotten out of that piece of data. You know, have you, have you ever tried moving the button to the other side of the page? We tried that and it lost. Okay. How many times did you try it? How many ways did you try it? Once. You know, if that was something important, exactly. If that was something important, right. Or we tried that and it won and that's why it's sitting there. Cool. Did you try to get any more out of that win? Does, you know, if your consumer liked it 10% the first time, is there another five, eight, 10% to squeeze out of that on top of that? Because they've already told you this matters to me, right? So be ready to do this from the perspective of you're going to lose more often than you win. The second you lose, stop, but keep going until you find that win in there. It doesn't mean it was a bad idea. It means that you just got to give it a few tries. So, you know, I think one thing that can help someone that doesn't have the luxury of someone like you, uh, a CXO, <laughs> right. And doesn't have all these visits. You can go steal good ideas from big weaponized websites. Absolutely. And the, the trap is, so here's a law firm. So show me some websites that you like. And they go, well, I like law firm, whatever, law firm, whatever. Well, those websites are maybe you like them, but they could be just a bunch of guessing. But you're insisting on that. When you go look at a website that's totally disconnected, but you study their buttons, their colors, where they put them, there's a lot of stuff, great ideas yeah. you can steal. Absolutely. I would say that... Um, the places you want to steal from aren't always your competition. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, competitive review is a uh, hundred percent a necessary step in all of this and trying what you see other people trying in that regard. If you have the opportunity, you should absolutely be doing that with your competition because if they have stumbled across something, they're just handing it to you basically to, to, to try, right? But I think the place that you want to spend as much time as you can, um, whether it's in your space or not, is where your audience is, right? What are the messages they're listening to? What is the design style that seems to be working for them? What, what does accessibility mean to them, right? You know, if, if your consumer is sitting in the 60s or 70s, why does every site they visit have larger text on it? I mean, and, and I, you know, I, I say that tongue in cheek with a smile on my face, but it's, but it's just the fact, right? It's just the truth. You know, just, just think about who you're talking to and stop going back and saying, well, I really like this site. Well, that's true, but their audience doesn't match yours at all right. in the slightest, right? Think, think about who the conversation is with and go see where those people are gravitating to, see where they're converting start thinking about why you think that's true. Don't just go, well, you know, let's, let's go back to that same example. Well, AARP has, 
you know, <laughs> burgundy buttons all over their site. So now I'm going to burgundy buttons. That's, that's not the point, you know, and, why? And the why? same Cialis model. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Um, but why, why is that working? You know, why is that working for them? What about the approach is making that accessible and what can I learn from that? And how can I apply it to my own space? All right. So we're, we're this has been, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. You're a great guest. We, oh, you're very kind. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed your show. I've listened several times over. And then once we uh, hooked up this way, I pretty well ran the gamut. So, so what's like, what's like a great question that I should have asked, but I didn't. Oh gosh. <laughs> Um, hmm. that's a good one. You were really thorough today. Um, I think, um, I, I think the biggest thing, and, and we touched on this in that last point, but, uh, this is, this is hard and this is a slog, but it is a hundred percent worth it. It, it is literally compound interest in motion, right? Anything that you can do to make these improvements when you, when you experience those losses as painful as they are, you can shut them off and walk away from them and understand still that you're dealing with something sensitive to your consumer. But every time you put one of these wins into your experience from a conversion revenue, uh, just kept my consumer longer perspective. Um, you're, you're dealing with the compound interest of continuing to do that with your consumer time over time. And that will only continue to build on itself. And, and that's, that's the game, you know, you, even, even out of the gates, you're going to be wrong 60, 70% of the time. If you're doing it thousands of times, you're going to be wrong 80 to 90% of the time. Cause you're going to be covering ground that you've rooted around in that. If you can win 10% of the time, you're going to make money. You just got to know when to shut it off, when to move along and, and when to um, step on the gas. And, and it's, uh, <laughs> it, it can definitely get to be a lot of um, minutia. And, and I understand that that may not appeal to folks, but the answers are uh, in there and they're, they're telling them to you. I'm curious. One more question. Yeah. So when you go to a website or an online platform, is it really obvious to you they've, they've hung out in this area that you're in? Um, typically, yes. Typically, I can see when um, I've hit a site that is, has, has done some testing. Um, you know, more often than not, though, I, I cheat a little bit in that regard because there's always tags in their code. So I... I've been doing this a little too long that way. I just, I just tend to do it that way. Um, but I, yeah, more often than not, you can typically see when folks have spent some time having this conversation somehow, you know, what, whatever measures they have, they've, they've made some distance that way. But that said, um, you know, people do land in a very positive spot for themselves all the time. It, it, it's not as if, you know, these folks that we're talking about that have not experienced this, they've built this business somehow. They do have some of this understanding. It's just now trying to get to how do I, how do I get to that next step? So it's, it's not always that, it's not always that obvious. Sometimes people just get their consumer and they landed in a good spot to start. So folks that listen to this, I'm sure there's a handful of them that are curious and maybe want to talk to you. Can, can you kind of sing us a little bit how they can, <laughs> they can contact you or find you? You know, um, I, I think the way that I always kind of uh, easily slide out of this is, uh, you know, the bass never sings the lyrics. Actually, the bass always sings just these words like bum and digga and do and all of those things. And so um, I, I think that would be boring uh, for everyone. But um, I am, I, first off, I am easily found on LinkedIn. Um, we, we have just gotten the business off the ground. So I do not have even the website uh, formulated. We, <laughs> it's funny, um, we've, we've started with enough clients that we're, um, we're too busy working to 
put the rest of the pieces together, but uh, mm -hmm. I suppose that's a better way to go at it than the other way around. Um, so, so I'm hoping that we're going to have um, our site up in the next couple months uh, to basically be able to be better contacted um, in the interim because I wanted something to do with visible just so uh, I, I'm easily found. If you don't find me on LinkedIn, which is pretty easily done, um, you can also reach me at uh, visiblemike at gmail.com. I'm, I'm pretty easy to touch base with and um, I love to talk about this stuff uh, all day, so. Yeah, so uh, Mike Olson, Visible Insights. Did, can you, do your kids say daddy sing bass and, and mom is <laughs> sing dinner? <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's funny. Um, my, my kids have beautiful voices. Uh, as as uh, does my wife, um, but my kids are are uh, with my ex, and she and I were both uh, vocal performance majors, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, she she sang pretty low alto. She was close enough to tenor. I guess we could have done that song <laughs> if I'd have thought of it. <laughs> that would have been fun. <laughs> All right, Mike, yeah. you've been a great guest. Thank you for being on the ROI Online podcast. I, I really appreciate it, Steve. Um, I, I love what you're up to, and thanks so much for including me. All right, that's a wrap.